Hi, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Lunch with a Scientist. I'm Leah with Headwater Science Institute. Today, we're gonna to be joined by Melissa Hill, who is gonna tell us a little bit more about land conservation. So we'll get to that in just a minute. Before we get into that, I wanted to give you a couple Headwaters updates. As we've been telling you, we've got Robert Swan speaking next week, Thursday, March 4th. Please join in for his talk. It's free. You can watch it via a private link on YouTube as long as you just sign up for us to email you the link. And he is quite the world traveler who has walked both poles to further his mission to prevent climate change and try to stop the melting of the polar ice caps. So he's got a lot to say, really fascinating man. Please join us March 4th at 5.30 p.m. or you can watch the archives anytime until March 6th. And you can register for that at bit.ly slash polar pioneer. Our next update is just to remind you that our summer programs are coming very soon. We've got our registration coming up live any day now, so check back on our website. They're gonna run June 21st through August 20th, and we've got both our research experience and a girls only science program with the option to do a safe socially distanced camping for a week at Weber Lake. So great opportunity to add something to your college resume. Great opportunity to have some research to practice over the summer. So feel free to check out our website for more on that. And our last quick update is that we would love for you to join our team. If you know of someone who is looking for a career in science, we're hiring a director of programs, someone who ideally has a little bit of experience in education, working with nonprofits, and is passionate about teaching science. We would love to have you join our team. You can learn more about that at headwaterscienceinstitute.org slash hiring. So with all of that out of the way, I'm very pleased to introduce Melissa Hill to you. Melissa Hill grew up in Central Florida. She's been involved with land conservation since 2014. She graduated from the University of Florida with a master's in interdisciplinary ecology from the School of Natural Resources and Environment and um, has a certificate in environmental education and communication. So she's worked in many capacities in environmental protection. From 2016 to 2018, she collaborated on a pilot project to understand the biophysical and social intersections needed for conservation tools on the coast to protect sea turtle nesting. And she's done a lot of other things in between. On a day off, you can find her exploring the rivers of Florida, where she's coming to us from today. And today we're going to talk about how you protect a special piece of land forever. So I'm very pleased to welcome Melissa Hill. Hi, it's great to be here. Thank you so much. And so where are you exactly? Yes, so I am joining today remotely, of course, from Gainesville, Florida, which is located in north central Florida. And so for those of us up here in the Sierra where we're based, we're expecting kind of quiet weather, um, cold and sort of indoor wet sweater weather. What is it like in Florida in the wintertime? This is the perfect Florida day. I think this is why so many people move to our state. It's 72 degrees and full sun and just a perfect little breeze. So it's a great day in Florida. Wow. So does that mean that outdoor work in land conservation can happen year round? Yes, although inversely from out west, our summers can be really brutal for, for land management. Um, instead of dealing with snow and really cold temperatures in the wintertime, we deal with a lot of mosquitoes and ticks and really intense heat in the summer in Florida. But yes, we work year round. I see. So there's something to every climate, sounds like. Exactly. Well, we're so excited to hear more about what it's like to protect our beautiful, precious lands. So I will pull up your talk and I'll let you take it away. Great. Awesome. So hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction and the opportunity to join everyone today. I'm really excited to talk to all of you about something that I am so passionate about, and that is protecting land. So we'll get into it in a lot of detail. I'll even let you put on um, your land protector hat at the end and think about how you would go through a project and how you would make sure that at the end of the day, it's safe from development, safe from intensification. So 
Um, without further ado, go ahead and get started. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I am a land acquisition specialist and I work for a special type of nonprofit called the Land Trust. And that land trust name is the Lachua Conservation Trust. The plan for this talk today is I'm going to go into a bit of my background, what I studied, um, how I came to be here. And then I'm going to talk specifically about what a land trust is, that special type of nonprofit. I'll talk about the work that my land trust is doing right now in North Central Florida. And then we'll dive into the topic at hand. You know, we're going to discuss why should we even protect land in the first place. We're going to talk about how it works, how to pick a good project, what questions you should ask. And then last but not least, we'll talk about a recent project that my organization has been successful in and kind of share why it was so successful in the first place. So a bit about me. I grew up in North Central Florida and I went to school at the University of Florida which is a really big public institution located in Gainesville. And our mascot is the Gators, so go Gators. I studied both natural resource conservation and political science in my undergraduate career. And something that I really wanna share with all of you is that I had no idea what I wanted to study when I came to college. Um, I didn't even know when I was in high school. I wanted to be a scientist, but I had this conception in my head that to be a scientist, I had to be really good at calculus or I had to really be great at chemistry. And those things didn't come naturally to me when I was in high school. And so it wasn't until I came to college and my undergrad that I realized that there's so many different facets of creating good science, of sharing information, thinking critically, and so I'm really glad that I had that opportunity to learn that about myself and to go on to become an ecologist. Um, so I did my master's work in ecology. The next slide, I'll tell you about what I researched and how that worked. But so you feel like you know me a bit better. I wanted to just share two fun facts as well. One is I really love rock climbing. The picture on the bottom left is actually of me in Yosemite, which is a wonderful national park located in California where you are. And I also was on the television show, American Ninja Warrior, which was really fun. So two fun facts. And now I will tell you all about my scientific research. So my master's research, I really focused on science that tied together habitat conservation, the feasibility of it, with understanding people's opinions. More specifically, I worked to understand what beachfront property owners would and wouldn't do to protect sea turtle nesting habitat in coastal Florida. It's a big question because sea turtles are a threatened and endangered species and the bulk of land owned along the coast in Florida is owned by private individuals. So that means that every landowner gets to decide more or less how they want to manage their slice of beach. It's their backyard. And that can have really serious impacts on the viability of this species, sea turtles. So um, the way that the research boiled down to just day to day was I did a ton of surveys. So it was in human dimensions. I mailed people, I called them, I did one-on-one -on -one interviews, got really good data, analyzed all that in spreadsheets, combined that with mapping analysis of where the most intense volume of sea turtle nesting habitat was happening on the coast um, to come up with some good pragmatic recommendations for coastal property owners and ways that they could actually implement conservation behavior on their property. And the thing that I really stepped away with from that process was that you have to understand people to effectively carry out changes in policy. Science is excellent and it should definitely drive our decision making, but if we're not pairing that with understanding the people that will be using that information, it's really hard to make changes in policy, to protect a species or to reverse climate change. So that understanding really helped me in my role as a scientist and in my work today, which is focused on permanently protecting natural lands by creating parks and preserves at a nonprofit land trust. So that brings me to the next portion of this presentation, which is the question, what is a land trust? 
So I'll just let all of you think for a moment. Have you ever heard of a land trust? Maybe you've worked with one in the past. They've done something in your neighborhood, your community. Well, I'll start by saying that in the United States, there's a lot of different ways that land can be protected, right? Um, think about national parks. Those are managed and purchased by the federal government. Um, state parks, they vary by each state where that funding comes from, county and city parks that's done at the local level. And land trusts are a special type of non-governmental, non-for-profit organization that helps fill gaps that governmental agencies like the federal government, like the state, really can't do. Um, and so we work very closely with our communities to identify gaps in landscapes and to permanently protect land through purchase. And across the United States, there's over a thousand land trusts in the state of California. Um, I believe there's about 80. And so they vary in scale on how big of an area they work in, what types of things they specialize in. So I encourage you to find your local land trust and see what it is they're up to. Now the land trust that I work for is based in North Central Florida. Um, I live, I hope you can see my mouse, in Alachua County, which is kind of in the center. And we work in 16 different counties in North Central Florida. And we do a lot of things that all build and contribute to our ability to permanently protect land. So what exactly does that look like? And what exactly do we do? Well, there's a lot of different components to working with a community and to effectively protecting a place. A portion of that is advocacy. That's a picture of me and some of my colleagues in Washington, D.C. two years ago. We went up to advocate for increased legislation that provides more funding for, provides increased protections for natural lands. Um, we also work with local elementary schools to provide in the field opportunities for folks to get a sense of what it feels like to be a scientist, um, similar to Headwaters. We have really great internships where folks can come out and get some boots on the ground experience, learning what it means to be a land manager, how to work a chainsaw, use prescribed fire. We do a lot of restoration on the properties that we do own and manage to make sure that they're sound habitat for important wildlife. And we work with our community to bring together a lot of different stakeholders and organizations that care about the resource to have successful projects. And those projects, where land protection comes in. Um, but before we talk about land protection um, and the step-by-step -step process for that, I really wanna underscore why it matters in the first place. So put on your thinking hats, ask yourself, why does it matter? Why do we need to permanently protect natural lands in the United States? And I'll let you think about that for just a minute. Um, I'll take a pause. So hopefully you thought of something. There's a lot of answers out there. Um, some of my favorite answers for why it matters is land protection is really important for clean water, for clean air. It has a lot of ecosystem services that these natural spaces are providing us with things that we need to live and survive as well. It ensures we have healthy fisheries, places outside for us to play and recreate space for wildlife. Um, natural spaces help reverse impacts of climate change by sequestering carbon. And it also is an important place to protect cultural resources as well. So in the United States, how much land is already protected, right? What's our benchmark? What are we starting at out? So go ahead and take a guess and I'll show you the answer. 12% of land is protected in a natural state. So if we know that protecting natural lands matter, well, is that enough? Do we need more? How much are we losing? So how much natural land do you think is lost every minute to development, um, to intensification, for urbanization, infrastructure creation, and mineral extraction? So. Every minute, if you were to take a guess, would you say, oh, it's probably 10 by 10 foot square? Well, actually, we lose two football fields, which is about three acres, 
every minute to land conversion, so land loss. And that's a picture of the University of Florida football field for size reference. Um, so, all right, land protection is really important for clean air, clean water, healthy fisheries, places to be outside. And we're losing a lot of it, but we already have some protected, but should we be protecting more? And a really great report just came out from the Center for American Progress called How Much Land Should America Keep? And this report looks at and summarizes an incredible amount of data, right? That helps us determine how much natural land we still need to have the population we have in the United States, still have clean air, water, lands to process and store carbon, enough wildlife habitat to, pre to prevent large scale extinction. And these scientists said, hey, right now we have 12%. We need at least 30% by 2030, if we're going to make sure we have a viable planet, preventing climate change and providing for wildlife habitat and clean air and clean water. And the report goes on to say that this is the starting point and it's probably the minimum, but also that it's a really complex question to answer. And it's not just, all right, let's pick another 18%, get it done today. There's a lot of thought that has to go into it. And the report sums it up really beautifully. And so I'll just read that quote for you. The report says that this number alone cannot adequately answer the question of how much of America's lands, waters, and wildlife the country wishes to protect. There can be no single or simple answer to a question that is simultaneously moral, economic, religious, historical, cultural, scientific, and for many people, deeply personal. A discussion of how much nature to protect and how, where, and for whom must honor and account for the perspectives of all people, including communities that are disproportionately affected by the degradation of natural systems, communities that do not have equal access to the outdoors, tribal nations whose sovereign lands, whose sovereign rights over lands, waters, and wildlife should be finally and fully upheld, communities of color, and others. End quote. So that's to say that this report knows that this is a, a, a good goal to start with, but that it's a pretty complex one to accomplish. And it will require all hands on deck from local communities advocating for land conservation, leaders to ensure funding to purchase and protect lands, and agencies and nonprofits to be able to purchase and manage these properties for the long term. Which brings me back to my work as an ecologist and an employee for a nonprofit land trust, which for the work that I do, we're equipped, we're organizations that are already set up to be doing this type of land concert work, conservation work. We know we have a big goal, we know it's urgent, we know we're losing land fast, but where do you start? How do you pick a good project with all of this in mind? So I'll let all of you take a second to think about what even makes a good project? If you were to look at a map of the state you live in and the county you live in, how would you figure out which piece of property matters? So take a minute, think about maybe the types of data you would think about or the types of questions you would ask to pick a really good project. All right, so hopefully you've thought of some questions you could start with. And I think that just in general terms, there's kind of three categories, right? There's the ecology side of things, the natural sciences. There's what people and communities value. And then there's a blend of both, right? So some of the ecology questions that you could be asking to figure out if it's a good project could be what natural resources are on the property. Does it have water impacts? Um, will it protect wildlife species? What about threatened and endangered species? Is there good existing habitat on the property? Is it connected to existing protecting lands? So what I mean by that is, is it a 10 acre lot in the middle of a shopping mall or is it 10 acres next to a state park that's already there and already has benefits for wildlife? So those are some things you could think about from an ecology perspective. 
And then from people and community perspective, will local communities value it? Do they want to see it protected? Do other partners and agencies have a shared vision or a goal for that piece of land? Um, is the project that you're picking, is it serving communities fairly? Is it being accessible for different communities of varying economic status, communities of color? Is it respectful and appropriate for tribal nations? Um, does the property protect locations of archeological and cultural significance? Um, and then of course, kind of your feasibility question is, does the landowner want to work with you? And will you have money to pay for it? So there's a lot of great resources that exist. Um, for Florida specifically, there's this whole cache of data layers that you can look at to think about ecology aspects as well as some of the social science aspects. And so I encourage you to look at your state and think about what types of data and known um, important resources are already cataloged that could help you make those types of choices. So let's say you've answered all these questions and you've decided that it's going to be a good project. So you know you found a good project. And what I mean by project is a, a good piece of land. Um, and now it's time to go to work to protect that property. So how does that look? What is the actual process that I go through with a landowner to permanently protect their, their piece of property? Well, there's a lot of steps and I just wanted to kind of quickly sum it up. So that way you have a good idea of the start to finish, but don't feel overwhelmed by all the details. So first you're gonna have initial discussions. You're going to have identified your project, that piece of land that you wanna to work to protect and you'll meet with the property owner, right? Someone owns that land, someone lives there. And so you'll meet with them and you'll determine what their goals are. And based off of that, you're gonna pick the right tool to permanently conserve their land. What I mean by that is there's different options for permanent protection. The most kind of straightforward way to think about it is to purchase it, right? You buy it, you put it under conservation, it has public access, that's option one. There's other tools like conservation easements, management agreements, um, donation, things that are a bit more complex and that I'm not gonna dive into for the point of this conversation, but just know that there's a lot of really creative ways to protect places. Once you've determined the right tool, um, you're going to then go ahead and have a site visit. So you'll actually go out to the property, You'll go around with the property owner, you'll see is the data that you pull that you see on maps, is that matching what's out there, the types of communities and natural resources that it's serving? Um, and then you'll go ahead and bring in partners. You'll work with different agencies, local community groups, maybe local government to start bringing together a strong coalition of people who will work to protect that land. From there, it's time to do some project planning. So you have your property, you have your contacts, you have your first list of partners. You're gonna then make a budget, which doesn't sound that exciting, but it is critical, I can guarantee that. So you'll start outlining the project costs, kind of get an estimated timeline for how you think you'll do it. And part of that is identifying possible funding sources. So a big part of my job is to actually identify grants. So working with foundations to help fundraise money um, working with local community members to do fundraisers, as well as working with state and federal agencies to access the type of resources that they have available for land conservation. And this whole time, you are communicating with your partners, um, you know, with that strong coalition you built who's going to help you get this project to the finish line. Next is what I call our due diligence phase which is really kind of digging deep into the, the real estate transaction part of land conservation. So you have to order a certain amount of review on the property. For example, you have to have a survey done, which tells you where the formal boundaries are. Um, you order title work, which essentially is the um, known ownership history of that property. Um, if there's any types of 
liens or issues on the property, you go ahead and figure that out, um, as well as getting an appraisal, which is a honest fair market evaluation of what the property is worth. So that helps you refine your budget and know how much it's going to cost. And then you make a contract with the landowner, you agree to those terms. Um, and once again, you communicate with your partners because that is so key to make sure that projects make it to the finish line. Last, if you make it to the final stage, this is kind of the most fun in my opinion, um, but it's the project closing. So you're actually going to purchase the property, right? If that's your tool for conservation, you're gonna make sure that you meet funding needs. And what I mean by that is any type of grant or state or federal cost share that you've brought in, you're going to make sure that you do their reports at the end of the day, that if they have to do a site visit, you bring them out there, you check all your boxes. Um, then typically for land trusts, we begin managing the property, which means we start doing habitat restoration. We start putting in um, hiking trails for folks to come out and enjoy the resource. And we ensure public access. So we'll have like a grand opening, which is really wonderful to see the community out and enjoying pro property that they helped protect. Um, and of course, you thank your partners who helped you get to this point. So now we know why protecting land matters, right? We're losing a lot of it quickly, it provides a ton of benefits for us. There's some urgent work to be done. We have an idea of how to pick a good project, what types of landscapes lend themselves to being valuable for both ecology and for communities, for the people that live there. And we have a quick overview, overview here of the actual process of finding a property and moving through and protecting it permanently. So let's take everything we just learned in the last 20 minutes or so and put it into practice. So Pretend that you are a land conservation expert and this is your working area. So this is, we're looking at Florida again. And within this, um, we have, here I'll draw on it potentially. Nope, that's not gonna happen. Okay, so this light yellow background is the counties that my land trust, the Lateral Conservation Trust that we work in. And this brighter background here, this dark black boundary, that is outlining a really important watershed for our region. It's called the Santa Fe River Basin. And this is a very important watershed because it surrounds an entire river, the Santa Fe River, which runs along where my cursor is pointing, kind of right through the middle of it. It also surrounds its main tributaries, um, which is a series of primarily four different um, creeks and rivers that feed the basin. And it has a lot of opportunity. So not only is it a key watershed for the region, but it doesn't have a ton of land currently protected in there. You can see the blue on this map are lands that are protected in Florida. And in the basin, there's only about 10%. So there's a need for increased protections. And there's a specific list of threatened and endangered species that have the bulk of their range based in this watershed. Now, it's also really important regionally for the local economy. Um, there's a lot of outdoor recreation and tourism that happens in the basin. And part of that is because of how many springs there are. So if you look at this map and you see all these pink dots, every single dot is a freshwater spring. And on the next slide, I'll show you a picture of that so you don't have to imagine what it looks like. Um, but let me highlight why springs are so important. So in Florida, our drinking water, almost 90% of it comes from the Florida aquifer. And the Florida aquifer, is essentially an underground system of porous rocks and caves underneath our feet, right? Subterranean, where water is replenished and flows and creates these incredible systems underground 
um, and is entirely recharged or replenished through rainfall seeping through the ground system. Now, under the bulk of the state, this system remains underground, but occasionally there are windows into the aquifer that are known as springs, which is where a natural upwelling of our drinking water comes out and is accessible on the surface. So in this basin, there's 90 springs. Um, and I wanna talk about why that answers a lot of your questions that we thought about for what makes a good project. So here's a photo of a really well-loved spring. Um, you can see here in the middle, this really beautiful blue. That is our drinking water flowing up out of the ground to the surface and into the river. So it's pretty amazing. It has a huge tourism drive for it. There's a lot of cultural and archeological ties to springs in Florida. And more importantly, springs are a really critical indicator for the quality and quantity of water that we have on hand in the state. So it's really important to protect lands around these springs from pollutants, development, um, and other types of intensification. So land conservation is really critical. So with that in mind, you're now working local knowledge of Florida. Um, let's take a closer look at the basin and we'll talk about a project that was successful and part of why it was successful. So you can see this red ring here. There's a smaller red blob, which I'll put my pointer right on top. And this is a project called Santa Fe Springs which our land trust successfully protected. And we'll go ahead and highlight why it was a good project. So thinking back to those questions earlier, what makes a good project? Well, for one, um, the size of this project was really good. So it was about 250 acres. And more importantly, it connected to existing protected areas. So it closed in a corridor, allowing for wildlife to migrate through. It's in this critical watershed, right, in the Santa Fe River Basin, where drinking water is directly tied to Springs Health. And on the property itself were two freshwater springs. So that's a pretty big deal in a basin that has 90 springs to have one project that has two springs located in it. That's kind of a win-win. Um, additionally, in this part of Columbia County, there wasn't a ton of public access to the river or to these springs. So you're providing public access to the community to a previously private area and natural resources, which is really important. Additionally, the landscape of the project um, was historically had a really important ecosystem type for the region known as longleaf pine sand hill. And there is an excellent opportunity to restore some of that ecosystem and really increase the types of wildlife benefits that are happening on the property. Now, that's a lot of reasons why it's a good project. And you might say, Melissa, you know all of that because you live in Florida and you're familiar with the area, but there's a lot of great data resources you can use to inform those decision making. Um, specifically, I'm going to show this map, which is just a quick look at the amount of data layers that you can put on top of each other in the state of Florida to help justify why a project is so important, right? So you can see the property boundary, which is in red. Um, then there's a whole list of environmental protection agency waters not attaining standards, which essentially mean that those waterways need increased protections, need increased conservation or reduction in nutrients. And you can see that this project overlaps both yellow and green. So it's protecting two of those water body delineations from the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency. It's connecting existing conservation lands. You can see the data shows you where the spring heads are. You can see it's connecting to waterways, Alusty Creek and Santa Fe River. Um, and I could have added a lot more data layers, but I didn't want to scare everyone by looking at just a bunch of colors <laughs> on a map. So but that's to say that you have data to, to support your project selection. 
Um, and it's a really great way to share those tools with people. So Alachua Conservation Trust worked together with a lot of different partners. You can see on the left that there's a couple of different funding partners. Two of those are from state agencies. One is the Water Management District, um, which is something that oversees the water quality and quantity from the state's perspective in Florida. The Florida Department of Environmental Protection, uh, the Conservation Alliance, which is a nonprofit grant-making organization, and a lot of individuals and private family foundations. So this project was successful because you can see just how beautiful the actual land, the resources, that's a, per that's a photo of the main spring on the property. Um, and we were able to accomplish it in May 2020. Um, but remember those, those tiles I showed you of the projects and how it progresses from initial conversation with the landowner all the way to closing? This project took almost a decade um, from first talking to the landowners to getting to this point. So land protection takes a lot of momentum building, it takes a lot of partnership building, and it takes a lot of fundraising and working with your community. So um, I know I'm starting to run out of time, so I'll tie it up with this last slide, which is a question for you. How can you save land? So hopefully today you feel like you have an understanding of why land protection is really more critical than ever. Um, you have a basic understanding of how to go out and do it, um, so I'd encourage you to find a land trust. There is a great way to plug in and connect with your community right away just by joining land trust community. You can advocate for funding that supports land conservation with your local government or at the federal level. You can volunteer your time with the land trust. Um, and you can share what you learned today with people. That's a really easy way too. You could say, hey, did you know that two football fields of land are lost every minute to development. Um, and lastly, spend time in the places you love. So if you have a park near your house, um, you know, if you're fortunate uh, and have enough access to get to a really big national forest or national park, you know, spend time there because it shows that you love it. Um, and if you can't spend time there, spend time thinking about it because that matters too. So um, I'll go ahead and wrap it up and I'll open the floor to any questions that might come through, but thank you for letting me spend some time with you today. Hopefully you uh, feel motivated to protect land permanently like I do. Thank you very much, Melissa, that was great. So I want to jump into a couple questions here um, that I had while you were talking. Let's go back to the end of the land protection process where the land trust is actually ready to buy the land so that you can begin restoration efforts or protection. How does the land trust go about acquiring the land? Do they fundraise or how does that process work? Yeah, so... Um... I would say that it's going to vary between every land trust a little bit based on what types of resources you are able to work with. For our land trust, a lot of our fundraising efforts are combined with individual donations. So because we're a nonprofit, folks can give a dollar to help protect a place. They can give $20, um, you know, whatever works for each person. And that's really important because those individual donations prove really critical when we go to apply for bigger grants through either the federal government, through state agencies, or through private foundations to show that there is already community support and interest in seeing a place protected. So we will leverage a lot of different cost share opportunities. Um, this project that I showed you at the end we had seven different grants piling into it in addition to individual donations. So it's really, um, you know, a, a patchwork of different opportunities to make, to make it happen. Mm -hmm. A long process of community support. Yes. Yeah. Like. 
And if you are watching from the Tahoe area where we're based, you can also think about the Truckee Donner Land Trust, which is a similar organization here in the California area. Uh, that's that great. Some of the public parks that we teach our programs on. So there's a little context there if you live in the Truckee area. So going into the next step, can you talk to us a little bit about how the land trust works with scientists to then decide what to do with the land? Do they weigh different factors and figure out which preservation effort to work on first or how does that work? Yeah, absolutely. So at most land trusts, um, if they are able to, you know, on staff, you'll have a land manager who's typically a biologist by training, an ecologist, um, and is really familiar with the local ecology and restoration needs. There's a lot of data that drives um, restoration efforts in Florida. Um, we do the largest amount of acres burned annually for prescribed fire. Um, so that's a huge part of our ecosystem. And so a lot of Florida restoration looks like reintroducing prescribed fires. So that way native grasses and flowers can seed, um, threatened and endangered species have types of habitat that they need to flourish and survive in. And so typically once a property is purchased, you know, the land manager will go out, look at it, walk around, look at data layers and soil types um, and elevations of a property to figure out what type of habitat was there historically. Um, and you can use a lot of clues when you're out walking around. A lot of plant species indicate, ah, this is a sand hill or this was a hardwood um, area on the property. And you can use those clues paired with data to guide your decision-making process for restoration on the property. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And I want to talk a little bit about how different types of scientists work together for one big conservation effort. You showed us a great map with all those data layers. And let's say maybe there's a species in threat, but there's also some flora and fauna that need restoration, some waterways. How do you manage all those different layers of the map and figure out what to do first? Yeah, so I think that as you said, a lot of different layers, a lot of different indicators, and all of those pair together with partners in the region. So if it's a threatened endangered species, that means that you're probably gonna go straight to working with US Fish and Wildlife Service with, for the state of Florida, we have a local or a state-based Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission as well. And so the data layers not only point you to the types of habitat and species that you need to be thinking and working about, but also the types of people and agencies that you need to be thinking about and working with. Because as you said, scientists really tend to specialize. They have things that they're incredibly good at and being able to collaborate with those experts and have them out to the property and get their input helps you create a really cohesive, not only a management plan for how you're going to restore and manage the property long-term, but also help identify who your funding partners can be to have community buy-in and protect the property in the first place. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like there's really a lot of work that can be done if you are someone that's interested in conservation or preservation. Um, and I'm wondering for a student watching who wants to do something like that, but doesn't know what specialty they wanna pursue, what would you recommend? Yeah. That's, I mean, that was me. <laughs> I knew that I liked being outside and I knew that I liked, you know, our protected places immensely. And honestly, it was really helpful for me. I started volunteering with a land trust um, and I started to understand all the different components of science that work together cohesively to protect these really wonderful places and to manage them. And so you know, working with a land trust in your community, reaching out, understanding what the jobs those people do there, um, as well as volunteering your time if you're able to, are great ways to learn about yourself and also the field that you're interested in. Mm -hmm. Well, we've got some great recommendations from someone who has made her way through the field. So I appreciate that. Uh, we're gonna wrap up in a minute, but I wanted to end just kind of with a fun question. So we heard at the beginning that you went from 
working with turtles to now being more inland and obviously you don't see turtles much, at least sea turtles. Um, what do you see regularly in your work and what are some of your favorite aspects of the job? Yes, um, so I'm really fortunate. I get to work on um, properties both directly on the river, on the Santa Fe River that I talked about in the presentation. And that means that I get to see a lot of springs. So that photo of that beautiful deep blue pool with people swimming in it and having a great time. I love seeing that type of habitat. Um, you know, not only are people out there enjoying and loving it, but when you get a little further down the river, you see all these different types of species that really value that type of ecosystem and thrive there. So I love that. And then thing two um, is I work in a lot of forested areas as well. And around this time of the year um, in March, it's wild flower season for us. And the types of diversity that we have in those types of systems are amazing. We'll have sometimes in really nice properties over 150 different types of, of plants and flowering species. So really mind blowing to see all the different types of plants that are out there. And it's, I mean, I love Florida. So honestly, anytime I get to be outside. <laughs> Great. Well, now we all want to go visit Florida and volunteer for a conservation project. So your job is well done. So thank you so much, Melissa Hill. We really appreciate you sharing information with us and I hope you have a great day. Yeah, thanks so much. You too.